What is the scariest or most disturbing crime that remains unsolved today? The Chicago Tylenol Murders The Chicago Tylenol Murders were a series of poisoning deaths resulting from drug tampering in the Chicago metropolitan area in 1982. The victims had all taken Tylenol branded acetaminophen capsules that had been laced with potassium cyanide. 1. James William Lewis was convicted of extortion for sending a letter taking credit for the deaths and demanding $1 million to stop them and he was also the primary suspect in the killings despite living in New York City at the time. The incidents led to reforms in the packaging of over-the-counter substances and to federal anti-tampering laws. From my own country, the Brabant killers or as we call them de Benda van Nivel, the gang from Nivel. 28 people killed, 40 wounded. They committed armed robberies, tortured people, sometimes they didn't steal anything that had any value, coffee and wine. The case is still unsolved to this day, not one of the gang members was ever caught and despite a hell of a lot speculations nobody but the gang members have any clue who they were. The Bloody Benders, America's first serial killer family. They had a small tavern set up in a lonely part of the West in the 1800s, and any time someone came in whom they believed nobody would miss they'd murder them and take all their valuables. When the law caught on to what they were up to they fled and were never caught. In the early 1900s a woman in San Francisco made a deathbed confession claiming to be the daughter of the family but nobody knows whether or not she was telling the truth. The murder of Adam Walsh. At the age of four he was abducted from a Sears in 1981. His decapitated head was later recovered, but his body was never found. Otis Toole claimed he and Henry Lee Lucas were responsible for the murder, but that remained dubious as he and Lucas had confessed to hundreds of crimes with which they had been unaffiliated. Adam's father, John Walsh, has since gone on to be the host of America's Most Wanted and the CNN series The Haunt. The 1993 murders of three eight-year-old boys in Memphis. A lot of you are probably familiar with the story, for example hogtied, genitals mutilated with a knife, and buried in a riverbed. The West Memphis three were wrongly convicted and imprisoned for over 18 years, before DNA testing provided reasonable doubt. One of the victim's stepfather has been widely believed to be the actual murderer, with supporting evidence, but was never convicted. Every time I think about what happened to the boys, I cringe and shiver, but I am possibly more disgusted because those three innocent teenagers spent so long in prison when the dipshit dad roamed free, and tried to sue the Dixie Chicks, hilarious story. Makes me fear the judicial system more than murderers. Bradford Bishop, who slaughtered his wife, mother, and three sons in their home in Potomac, Maryland in 1976. He loaded the bodies into the family station wagon, drove them to a remote park in North Carolina, partially buried them set the gravesite on fire, and then disappeared. It's believed that he used his foreign service language skills to travel in Europe ever since, but no one knows for sure. The Icebox Murders Houston so-called Icebox Murders of Fred and Edwina Rogers, an elderly couple living in Montrose, may be one of the strangest cases yet. On June 23, 1965, Edwina's nephew Marvin became concerned about the couple when his phone calls to his aunt went unanswered. Marvin asked police to check in on the couple, who complied. When police responded, they found the house locked, but forced their way in. Food had been left on the table, which somehow led to the officers checking inside the fridge. What they found, numerous cuts of washed, unwrapped meat was neatly stacked on the shelves, which the officer thought came from a butchered hog, didn't seem all that out of the ordinary. But as the officer went to shut the door, he saw the Roger's head staring back at him. They had been stashed in the vegetable crisper. That meat turned out to be the Rogers legs and torsos. Investigators said that a claw hammer had been used to beat Fred to death, and both of his eyes had been gouged out. Police determined that Edwina had been shot in the head, and both had been hacked into pieces in the bathroom. The house was eerily, devoid of blood, and appeared to have been thoroughly cleaned. Stranger still was that their sex organs had been thrown in the sewer outside of the house, and that other missing body parts were never recovered. Also, there was the 43-year-old unemployed hermit's son, Charles Frederick Rogers, who apparently lived with his parents in an attic bedroom but whom neighbors didn't recall ever seeing. The only drops of blood in the house led to the son's attic room, and a bloody keyhole gave more of a hint as to what was to come, but when investigators entered, no Charles. In fact, he just disappeared, and was declared legally dead in 1975, ten years after the murders. In 1992, the authors of the book The Man on the Grassy Knoll theorized that Charles was a CIA agent who was involved in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. According to their work, 
Rogers was a CIA agent who likely impersonated Lee Harvey Oswald in Mexico City and, along with Charles Harrelson, was one of two shooters involved in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. There's no telling who Charles actually was, considering he communicated with his parents only by writing notes that were slipped under the door and didn't appear to interact with any other actual human beings ever. For me or would be the murder of my mother. She was murdered when I was three months old. She was holding me in her arms apparently when she was attacked. I'd if I was knocked out of her arms or what but they say I was found in an ally next to her body where she was raped and strangled with her own pants. Had it not been for a fluke that a woman decided to throw away some trash in a dumpster that was in the ally of an abandoned apt building I might not have been found and apparently I was there for a couple of days. I really would like to know who murdered her. Can't be certain if this is exactly a crime but Benjamin Kyle's case is pretty insane. He was found naked and unconscious in a dumpster behind a Burger King in 2004 having absolutely no idea how he got there and having no idea who he is. He never regained memory of anything in his life prior to 2004, and still does not know his identity. Despite DNA tests and extensive searches, no one has ever come forth to tell him who he is, and there are no past records of his existence. Hinter Kaifek. It was a mysterious murder of six family members on a rural German farm that took place in 1922. Weirder still, the murderer continued to live in their house for some time. Here's a small excerpt from an article about it. Before March 31st, Gruber had described to neighbors things that had happened in the past days and weeks. Things that made his maid, before Maria, leave the farm. Footprints coming from the dense forest behind the farm but none leading back. Footsteps heard in the attic. An unfamiliar newspaper showed up. Keys went missing. When Gruber one day checked his tool shed he could tell from the damage that someone had tried to pick the lock. Nobody knows exactly when the murders started. The autopsy reports could give us a clue if they indicated how long each person had been dead. Reading online about this case, people believe that all six were butchered one by one. Joseph was killed while in his cot in his mom's bedroom. Maria was killed in her bedroom. Gruber, his wife, their daughter and granddaughter were murdered in the barn. Though we lack estimated times of death we know that the granddaughter died last from one horrifying detail, she had torn her own hair out. Apparently alive long enough to either witness the butchering or see just see the dead bodies before she was struck, the girl expressed the horror the only way she had left. The corpses were all beheaded. The skulls were sent to a lab but are now considered lost. All victims were placed without heads in their coffins. The entire farm was demolished in 1923. The only thing left is a shrine. Why did I mention that the one who committed this crime stayed at the farm afterwards? Someone had fed the livestock, had eaten food from the kitchen, and neighbors noticed smoke coming from the chimney as usual though the Gruber family was already dead. This one is mostly personally creepy, but my cousin was raped and murdered outside of Houston, and W side, on Thanksgiving 1995. Apparently there was plenty of evidence. But HPD pussyfooted around it and never really seemed interested in gathering info. My family was sure they knew who did it, and the guy they suspected had police connections. He was never interviewed by police. A lot of the evidence got lost and we never got an explanation, and the case is largely inactive now. My cousin and aunt were on the news about 10 years ago pleading for someone to reopen the case. One of my first memories as a kid was playing with pink Play-Doh in her apartment while my family was all cleaning it out. My mom was the last one in the apartment packing boxes and she got a very strange chill, like someone was watching her, grabbed me and noped then fuck out. Now all of my family says I look like her and sometimes it bothers me knowing I'm a vague living reminder of a dead family member. In Argentina, Alberto Nisman was a federal prosecutor, he was in charge of an exhaustive investigation concerning the AMIA terrorist hit. AMIA is the name of the Jewish community organization in Argentina. Their building was bombed. In 1994, Nisman appeared on TV several times claiming that the actual president of Argentina, Cristina Kirchner, was somehow involved in this hit, and that she helped cover the perpetrators. One or two days before the first day of court, he appeared dead in his house, with a fucking bullet in his head. The tapes of the building are not clear or deleted. Information is confusing. We don't know if it was a suicide because he realized his case was not good, or if it was a hit because his case was too good. It's not even the worst case we have here. I'm sorry it's late, so it probably won't get upvoted, but I think it's really fucking scary. A while back in the mid-90s there was an ongoing spree of murders in the Maryland area and DC area. The murders were done by an African-American mailman mid-30s. What he would do before he would attack his victims, is he would study their every movements, 
so he would know the right time to attack. Luckily his last victim actually made it out alive because she screamed the top of her lungs and her next door neighbor heard her and he ran to help her out. The story pretty much ended from there because he hasn't been back since and nobody has heard of him. In fact he is on America's most wanted top 10 list. Danny Casalaro was a journalist and freelance writer who was investigating an organization he called the Octopus. This organization theoretically had the power to put anyone they pleased into political power and might have been responsible for a number of different scandals. After Danny started investigating, he started receiving phone calls that harassed him and threatened him. He went so far as to tell his brother that if he died, it was not an accident. Later his housekeeper received a number of the same harassing phone calls. A few days later, he was found dead in his bathtub, covered in his own blood with cuts all over him, but nothing was found nearby to have given the cuts. A suicide note was found on his desk nearby, and because there were no signs of a struggle, Danny's death was ruled a suicide. His family, however, said that he absolutely hated his own blood to the point where he would vomit if he saw it, and would definitely not kill himself this way. Dan, D.B. Cooper, November 24, 1971, Flight 305, Dan Cooper hijacked a Boeing 747 going from Seattle to Portland. He demanded $200,000 in ransom and was given the money in Portland. He proceeded to jump out of the plane after it went back into the sky. And parachuted down. He has never been found nor any trace of him, the parachute, the money or any involved items. It is the only unsolved American plane hijacking incident in history. There was one where I lived don't know if it made national news if I'd remember right it happened in 78 or 79 a family of five up and disappeared they had one witness that said they saw them get into the car they had and the dad looked scared then left about a month later the car was found abandoned, the cops went to the house and found dinner on the table and the TV still on. Two years ago they found the bodies in a shallow grave in the desert all shot in the head two times. Whoever did it still is out there. Some think it was a hit others think it was a carjacking gone bad no one knows why they left in the first place. There is one story local to me that is a bit weird. Lapita Canta disappeared in 1990. Police never really investigated her disappearance, choosing to assume she abandoned her family. Her body was found nearly two weeks later, in Frio County, evidently the victim of murder. The body was sent here to the medical examiner's office but they never connected the body to the missing woman. It gets worse slash weirder. It took 21 years before a DNA analysis was performed to identify Cantu's body. Obviously, her family was unhappy about this whole thing. Both because no one seemed to care that she disappeared, no one seemed to care that the Jane Doe they found was murdered, and they had to wait two decades to even sort of know what happened to her. But once her body was ided, they wanted her exhumed so they could bury her properly. One problem, her body wasn't in the grave the government said it was in. A man was buried there instead. So her family still doesn't have her remains. Or, at this point, any clue where they are. A disturbing crime that still think about every once in a while is the disappearance of my aunt, disturbing because I was so close to it. Marjorie Maldonado Fairbanks, Alaska in 1993 My aunt left the house to go to the store and get some milk. She never came home. Eventually she was reported as a missing person, and they found her van parked behind a bar. That's basically it, they never found any trace of her things in the car, and it was before the day and age of cell phones. It's not really something we talk about anymore, we all went from wondering for years to just accepting she's dead. Skeptical. I would have to say that of Bob Crane. His private life was chaotic and everyone is so sure that his best friend John Carpenter killed him but it's impossible to tell who is guilty now. He was big in Love Star in the 60s and it's creepy knowing that his killer got away free. It's like an O.J. Simpson thing. You know he did it but they can't prove it. I recommend watching the movie Autofocus about Bob Crane's life. The Ketty Murders is an unsolved 1981 American quadruple murder that took place in Ketty, a former railroad town in the foothills of Northern California Sierra Nevada mountains. The murders took place in Cabin 28, during the late evening of April 11, 1981 and early morning of the 12th. The victims were Glenna Sue Sharp, known as Sue, age 36 her daughter Tina, age 12, her son John, age 15, and his friend, Dana Wingate, age 17. One two, Tina was determined to be missing some time after the crime was discovered. Her skull and several other bones were recovered in 1984 at Camp 18 California, in Butte County. Three, Sue's oldest daughter, Sheila, had stayed with next-door neighbors in Cabin 27 that night, discovering the murders the morning of April 12. Sue's two youngest sons and their friend, 
who were having a sleepover at cabin 28 that night, were found uninjured in the boys' bedroom that morning, 